welcome to our course on human evolution. Um, in this course, we're kind of going to kind of look at um, a few different topics within uh, evolutionary science. We're going to look at um, how we relate as a species to the rest of the animal kingdom, as well as what separates primates, of which, you know, family tree we are a member, um, what separates primates from the rest of the animal kingdom, right? So we'll kind of start out in a very general sense in this course, kind of going over some very basic concepts in evolutionary theory as well as genetics. And then we'll kind of, as we move through, start to narrow our focus, first starting with kind of what differentiates primates from the rest of the animal kingdom, and then starting to move into our own evolutionary history, um, first starting with some of our distant cousins, the Australopithecines, and then ending with the genus Homo, of which we are a member. Um, to just give you a couple brief details of about this course, essentially what we're going to do or what my expectations of you are um, is every week we'll have a lecture video that you will need to watch. There will be a discussion board um, where you will respond to a prompt that I post um, and your initial response is due by Wednesday of each week and your responses to two other students is due on Sunday of each week. Um, in addition to that, there is a lab activity every week. Um, there will be a short instructional video that you will watch and then you will complete the lab activity um, using the materials that we provide. Um, Apart from that, there are three exams throughout the semester. Um, they're broken down based on the chapters of the textbook. Exam one covers chapters one through five. Exam two covers chapters six through nine. And the final exam covers the last few chapters of the uh, book. Other than that, that's about what we have going on for the course for the semester. So as long as you kind of keep up with the weekly readings, as well as the discussion boards, you shouldn't have any problems with um, you know, taking the exams and getting out of the class with a decent grade. Um, so to kind of move on here, um, the first thing we'll talk about is what is a science, right? Because studying human evolution is in fact part of science, right? And the goal of science is to investigate and understand the natural world around us, right? To explain events that we see in the natural world and to use those explanations to make useful predictions. So what we're doing in paleoanthropology is we're looking at the fossil record examining how those fossils look, making inferences on behavior and um, subsistence patterns and things like that based off of those fossils and seeing if we can make predictions for the next time we find a similar fossil. So science itself deals only with the natural world. So we're looking at things like dealing with frogs, um, scientists, uh, collect and organize information in a careful and orderly way, looking for patterns and connections between different events in nature. So scientists propose explanations that can be, and most importantly in science, tested by examining evidence, right? If your hypothesis cannot be tested, then it is not a good hypothesis for scientific study. So science is kind of an organized way of using evidence to learn about the natural world around us. So how is science done? Well, science begins with a hypothesis, which is based off of an observation, which is the process of gathering information about events or processes in a careful and orderly way, right? And data is the information that is gathered from making observations. There are two types of data. There's quantitative data which is the numbers and obtained by counting or measuring. So this is, let's say, if you were to take everyone in class and measure everyone's pinky finger and then run the averages, right, that measurement is considered quantitative data. But there's also qualitative data, right? And this involves descriptions and characteristics that cannot necessarily be counted. So a hypothesis is a scientific explanation for a set of observations that we see in the natural world, right? A hypothesis must be stated in a way that makes it testable. The hypothesis is just one possible answer to a question, and it must be thoroughly tested to gather evidence. And what's going to be kind of important in this, um, you know, as we move through the uh, presentation here, I really want you to kind of get into um, really cement the difference in your minds between um, a theory and a hypothesis because colloquially and in kind of pop culture and in common speech, we use the word theory 
very, very incorrectly um, quite often, right? So we'll kind of take a look at um, theories here in a second. Um, so the scientific method, we've all kind of learned about this in our um, kind of grade school uh, science classes. It's a series of steps that are used by scientists to solve a problem, right? And we all know the steps. It starts with an observation, asking a question, forming a hypothesis, designing a controlled experiment, recording and analyzing the results of said experiment, and drawing conclusions. So this leads to the formulation of a theory. If your hypothesis holds true, and even sometimes when you have a negative hypothesis can help formulate a theory, what it's doing is it's providing you with evidence. That evidence can be used to support a theory. So when we say that something is a theory, that means it's actually been tested scientifically and has some support behind it, right? So a theory may be formed after the hypothesis has been tested many times and is supported by much evidence. So a theory is essentially defined as a broad and comprehensive statement of what is thought to be true, right? So it's not necessarily a guess, right? You don't go, well, my theory is. No, 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 that's not how theories work, right? You should accurately say, well, my hypothesis is. So a theory is supported by considerable evidence, considerable scientific evidence. So in essence, we have things, um, you know, we have theories then versus natural laws. Natural laws are another thing that you see in um, kind of your bio, you know, your general science classes. And a natural law is something that is completely holds true at all given times, right? Like the force of gravity, right? The force of gravity is considered a natural law. Um, but really, you have to ask yourself, what really is the difference between a theory and a natural law? it's that kind of uh, area of doubt, right? With a theory, there's still a possibility that it may be proven wrong sometime in the future with further investigation or with different developments and uh, different scientific investigative techniques. Uh, a natural law, on the other hand, is going to be the same no matter what, in perpetuum, uh, forever. So what about evolution or the theory of evolution? The fact that we're calling it a theory in the first place means that there is considerable evidence that backs it, right? So is evolution, quote unquote, just a theory in our kind of pop culture sense? Absolutely not. It is something more. To date, there are over 1,000 valid experiments that confirm the theory of evolution. One of these experiments uh, we can watch uh, in you know live time the manipulation of genes in species like fruit flies, sand fleas, viruses, and bacteria, any of these multiple uh, fast reproducing uh, species. We can go in there, alter their DNA, and watch the changes happen in live time, right? And that is, in essence, a part of evolution. So let's uh, kind of switch gears here and look at um, you know, the study of human evolution falls under the kind of umbrella of something we call physical or biological anthropology. Um, so the question is, well, what exactly is anthropology, right? Anthropology, it actually comes from two Greek words, anthropos and lagos. And uh, anthropos means man and lagos means study of. Um, it's a holistic discipline, which means we try to look at multiple aspects of what it is to be human, and we focus on how those aspects intersect with one another, also known as intersectionality, right? So when you're looking at an anthropologist, that's someone who um, – you know, is specializing in one of these subfields that looks at a specific aspect of kind of the human existence, whether you're looking at cultural studies, you're looking at studies about language, you're looking at about studies about physiology and biology, or you're looking about studies of past human cultures. There are four fields of anthropology. There's biological slash physical anthropology. There is archaeological anthropology, as well as cultural anthropology, and the field of linguistics. And we'll talk a little bit about each uh, subfield here. So in biological anthropology slash physical anthropology, this is the study of human biological evolution and biocultural variation. It focuses on things like anatomy, the evolution of our species, as well as bioarchaeology, or how do um, recently deceased people um, compare in terms of our own modern biology, right? So this is looking at both how we've evolved over time in the ancient past, 
It's looking at the more recent past and in, in terms of looking at minor changes that occur between populations, as well as looking at how do modern humans or living humans uh, vary in their biocultural expression, right? Why do we have differences in skin tone? Why do we have differences in height? Um, these are all questions that anthropologists look at or biological anthropologists look at. We also have archaeology, which is the study of past peoples and cultures based on the material remains they leave behind. So in essence, in archaeology, we this is these are the guys who go out into the field. They dig very nice, nice neat uh, holes, and um, in essence, you know, pull these artifacts out of the ground and reconstruct how people in the past lived based on uh, an examination of those artifacts. And then we have cultural anthropology, and we'll kind of give you a real brief definition of culture here, kind of the best definition of culture that we have. But cultural anthropology is the focus, or their focus is studying culture and all of its different aspects. Why do humans do the things that they do, right? Why do they have different dances? Why do we have different religious practices? Why do we have different ways of rearing our children, right? These are all questions that a cultural anthropologist may look at. Um, and if we were to define culture, our most comprehensive definition comes from Edward Burnett Tyler back in the 19th uh, century, and he defined culture as the complex whole, which includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, morals, laws, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a human as a member of society. And the next subfield we'll look at here is linguistics, which is a study of the construction, use, and form of language in human populations. And uh, one of the more recent discoveries that we have in the field of linguistics that kind of intersects with biological and physical anthropology is the discovery of the FOXP2 gene. This FOXP2 gene, which popped up in our lineage at or around um, between 150 to 200,000 years ago, allowed for the um, neurological structures that allowed for the formation of speech or gave us that fine muscle control that allowed us to um, conduct speech. So language and evolution is kind of a very complex question in terms of biological anthropology because we have no idea when language actually started, right? And there's really no good scientific way to really ascertain that answer. Because yes, we can talk about when the genes happened, when the neurological structures may have formed, when the physical structures within our bodies may have formed the permitted language, but that does not mean that we know exactly when our species began communicating using symbolic language. Um, but language is a fundamental step in our evolution because it really is, or the use of symbolic language is really what separates us from a lot of the other higher apes. This is a feature showing one of the kind of structures that was formed by one of the um, structural genes that controls, um, that's kind of associated with the FOXP2 gene in terms of uh, working with your um, language acquisition. And this is the hyoid bone, which is actually related to or used in that fine muscle control that um, gives you the ability to speak. If we look at some other uh, what we call steps to humanness within our um, species that we're going to talk about throughout the semester in much more detail. At or around seven to nine million years ago, we have the split with our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. At or around six million years ago, we have the very beginnings of um, the shift to bipedality. Um, our ancient ancestors, are our ancient cousins and our family tree, most of them were um, you know, farther back in time, we're not complete bipeds, right? A lot of them were basically part-time bipeds, you know, walking on two feet sometimes and walking on all four at other times. So it really took a very long shift and a very long period of time in order for us to fully develop bipedalism. It wasn't about till three and a half million years, uh, really actually with the development of Homo erectus, and we'll talk about some of these differences, um, at or around two million years ago that we really got our first kind of actual true human-like um, walker slash runner. Uh, we'll also look at non-honing teeth, which happened around 5.5 million years ago. Our evolutionary lineage began to lose the very sharp canines that we see in most other mammalian species, um, and we'll talk about why that is. Uh, at 3.3 million years ago, we start to see the development of material culture, and by material culture, we mean stone tools, right? And we'll talk about kind of how stone tools have changed over time. 
At 2.5 million years ago, and this is a big estimate, this is just kind of where we're at, we think speech may have happened because we believe that speech needed to occur um, or language needed to occur before co large scale cooperative hunting um, could be successful in terms of hunting large game animals. And we'll talk about all that um, later on in the semester. At around 1 million years ago, we to start to see um, the hunting of large game animals like woolly mammoths and things like that. Um, and then at around 11,000 years ago, we start to see the um, domestication of different foodstuffs like ancient barleys and wheats. And we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages that farming and domesticated food had. So to kind of go over some of those um, kind of steps to humanness here, we have the evidence for bipedalism. There is a distinct bow plan shift, which bow plan is just a very fancy French word for how our body is constructed, um, resulting in a lot of marked changes in the pelvis and spine of early hominids, right? We saw a change in not only the pelvis and the pelvis and the spine, but we also saw a change in the skull as well. We're going to talk about each of those changes in fine detail. We're going to look at things like our bipedal gait. How do humans walk on two legs? And we're going to look at lumbar lordosis, which is one of those kind of interesting changes that we see in the spine that really um, has kind of become a fundamental um, adaptation that's allowed us to um, fully walk on two legs and more importantly, run on two legs. We will also look at a very interesting pattern that we see that occurs in the structures of all mammalian creatures that have skeletons. Um, and this is kind of interesting because, you know, this really goes to show you as kind of the fundamental evidence that, you know, we share a lot of DNA with a lot of other life forms on this earth and a lot of the uh, genes that are responsible for producing structures are actually the same across many species of creatures. What we're going to notice is as we look at various skeletons, we're going to see a pattern of one bone, two bones, uh, wrist or foot bones, and then finger bones or toe bones. Um, and this occurs everywhere. If we even look at the kind of ostrich that we see here, you see there's one bone up top marked in red. There's two bones down in the middle. There's some wrist bones as well as some finger bones. And we see this pattern in every single creature that has a skeleton and limbs. We'll look at the loss of non-honing teeth, or what we call the sectorial canine complex over time. We'll look at why our primate relatives and ancestors have these large canine teeth, but us as homo sapiens and modern humans, and even some of our uh, more distant relatives lo lost these honing teeth. And what we think is that the reduction in size over time indicates a behavioral tendency towards cooperation, because in a lot of primate species, at least from what we have observed, those canine teeth are in, actually in most mammals, canine Canine teeth are not used for eating. They're not used to rip apart meat. You have other teeth for that. Um, what they're used for is behavior. They're used for threatening. And usually males of the species have very large canine teeth. And that's because in a lot of species, males compete viciously with one another um, over access to mates. We also have other changes in human teeth over time that we'll talk about. Of course, we talked about the reduction of canines. We'll look at how our enamel has become thinner over time. We'll look at the increased incidence of cavities that really started to occur once we developed agriculture in our species. Um, we'll look at the reduction in the size of our molars that occurred over time as well. We'll look at material culture, like our earliest stone tools here, which are called Oldowan tools. At this point, they're not really using these to hunt. They're using them to crack open bones from scavenged um, remains and getting at the bone marrow inside. And then we'll talk about later tool types, the Achillean and the Mousterian tool types, which are our kind of true hunting implements, right? Your Achillean um, spear points can be used to actually hunt animals, as well as your Mousterian um, spear points are actually uh, much more refined and a lot sharper than the Achillean. But I also want to caveat this all with noting that cooperative hunting itself is not unique to humans, right? There are many species throughout the um, world and throughout the animal kingdom that cooperatively hunt with one another. We see this in dogs as well as in wolves as well as in um, some bird species and um, some fish and, um, you know, uh, water mammals as well. 
And just to give you an example from our own uh, primate family tree, here's a picture of chimpanzees, a group of chimpanzees enjoying a, the carcass of a red colobus monkey that they had just gotten done hunting, right? And we're going to look at primates in big detail, and we're going to look at um, kind of some of these different hunting techniques that these male chimps use in order to acquire um, fresh meat, right? So when you think about primates, you know, not all monkeys, apes, and uh, prostimians or lemurs and lorises are, um, you know, vegetarians. There's actually a fair degree of um, protein that's acquired either via insects or killing small creatures. And then finally, we will look at domesticated food towards the end of the semester, looking at the domestication of wild plants and animals, which all came with distinct advantages and disadvantages as well.